Welcome, Nuf. So you've been, uh, you, you're, I, I was reading a little bit about you and I read that you had started, you, you had an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. and then, you know, after searching a lot in, for solutions in allop allopathy, you moved to Ayurveda and yoga. Could you share a little bit about your background and that, that period of your life? So, um, I was born in 1980 and um, by the time of my birth, I was just 1 kg, 200 grams. And um, I was a very weak, unhealthy baby. Uh, till the time they discovered my true issue and my true illness, I was already 17, 18 years old. And I already struggled a lot with my health. Uh, till the doctors told my mom that we might not be able to help her because I reached to a limit where I was giving a lot of antibiotics. I was giving a lot of medications and too many diagnoses till the time I collapsed. And that time they discovered that um, I have lupus, something called uh, systemic lupus. And this disease, that time was very rare. The doctors told my parents that only 2% of people have it. And uh, they don't have any treatment for it. I have to live with corticosteroids and I was already giving a lot of medication. And in my case, because that time I was unable to even eat anything, I survived on porridges for baby food. I used to take that to my school and I wait for people to go to the break so I can take my baby food out and eat it without anybody sees me eating baby food. I was in high school. And then my parents just decided that I should quit school, stay home till they find a solution for my health. Or maybe they were hopeless because the doctors told my mom there, there isn't much hope. And I was 18 years old, but I was 35 kgs or 38 kgs, something uh, of that sort. So when they, I quit school, I stayed home um, and I found a yoga book. So. My dad brought a yoga book from one of his uh, trips. So my dad works for the Saudi uh, Arabia Security Forces Interior Ministry. And he was sent by the late um, interior minister to go and bring martial arts uh, to Saudi Arabia. So he was sent to Japan. And during his studies, he was exposed to meditation and different yoga practices. So he brought a book, but that book wasn't very easy to follow. But I was very curious about that book. So later I found a smaller book that I could follow. And I started with few asans. And I felt different. And I started searching, reading about naturopathic diets. And I started shifting to more whole, fresh foods and a lot of other recipes. So my life changed. And I decided that I will never stop practicing yoga. That was 98. And so now you're a yoga teacher and the founder of the Arab Yoga uh, Foundation yes. in Saudi Arabia. Yes. I mean, nobody would ever believe that there could be a yoga teacher in Saudi yes, Arabia. That's true. So, so and so, w I mean, are you allowed to practice yoga? I believe in uh, 2017, if I'm not wrong. Yoga. The approval, yeah. Could you share so, a little bit about yoga that? was not banned officially in Saudi Arabia, but it was not listed or recognized. And that time when I started teaching in 2004 in Saudi Arabia, um, women's sports were not publicly allowed. Now, the recent reforms and changes in the last three, four years in Saudi Arabia helped a lot of women like me. <coughs> who started the sports initiative to come out and to form their own um, centers or groups or whatever teams they created publicly and officially. But before that, we were not really stopped. I was in Saudi media since 2004. Nobody stopped me or investigated with me, but I struggled to find a license that I can operate under to open a center when uh, I, I, when a lot of people started asking me because um, 
I, I, com I continued doing yoga since 98 and I went back to school and I was on a naturopathic diet. I really improved. My symptoms improved. So I had very um, difficult symptoms to survive with or to go to school with or to study with. And I improved a lot. I won't say I healed, but I somehow improved that I could at least graduate from my college with high honors. I studied clinical psychology and I loved the studying what I'm studying beside yoga because while I'm, I was studying, I was studying a lot about neurology, a lot of um, uh, functions of the brain and how does um, certain practices affect the brain and the mental health. And it gave me insights how yoga is working inside my body. So I mixed both and then I went to India to study. Um, during that time, I was promoting yoga and trying to speak about it, but I was unable to do much um, in regards of like teaching others. People come to me and they say, teach me. I had to change my home um, in 2006 because people started just coming to my home. So that was the, the, the main thing that I decided to work for yoga to be approved and listed in Saudi Arabia so everybody can benefit from the service that is available for public. And so you've trained 3,000 people or taught 3,000 people? Okay. So this information may be from 2010. Okay. Now we train 10,000 people wow. and we have 700 yoga teachers all over the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Amazing, right? <laughs> yeah, when, in small cities also there is yoga, so you can find yoga teachers in Riyadh. I started in Jeddah. I, I grew up in Riyadh, but I moved to Jeddah. Uh, Riyadh is the capital, so we have around 100 teachers now in Riyadh. Uh, more than 500 teachers in Jeddah. We have also few teachers in Mecca, around 10 teachers. Um, we have teachers in Yambur, in Taif, in Abha, in Qasim. So, in places you never imagined that people would hear of yoga. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really curious uh, about this. So, um, you're a Padma Shri awardee. Many people did know, just a few days back, didn't know. And how did that happen? How did your connection with, how did the Indian government start recognizing your work? So, I honestly don't know. I so. don't know. What happened is, uh, we have been trying. So, when I started the Arab Yoga Foundation, it was basically Saudi Arabia Yoga School that time. And at 2010, I changed the name to Arab Yoga Foundation because I had a plan. We had teachers from all over the Arab countries. And um, people were here of yoga, people want to come and learn yoga. There is demands on yoga teachers and, and yoga classes, but still we were trying to do our best approaching um, authorities. So I opened the center and I had to close it. Then I opened another center. Now, my other center was called Naturopathy Company Limited. And the only license I could open under for Ayurvedic massages and yoga rehabilitation was physiotherapy at that time. That was the thing. And the Indian consulate was, um, I, I had friendships in the Indian consulate. They came to know, they started inviting me for events. They started initiatives for Indo Saudi medical uh, initiatives and stuff like that. So when yoga was listed by, um, the yoga day was recognized by the United Nations in 2014, um, we were very excited. So we already had a big yoga community in Jeddah and we were very excited that what is going to happen next. So yoga, how are we going to celebrate? And um, by that time, uh, Mr. Manoj Koshi joined me in the Arab Yoga Foundation. So we approached the consulate and we said, what is the plan? We have a big community for yoga here in Arab Yoga Foundation and we can maybe do something together. So they said, yes, of course, we want to celebrate. So we planned because in Saudi Arabia, we wanted people, research centers, government hospitals to come. Um, step forward with us to make the society or at least the authorities understand how yoga can benefit, especially a person like me. When I started, 
Um, I don't know if you know what is lupus, but lupus is a life-threatening disease. People can just commit suicide or get depressed or get a heart attack or a brain attack or anything, a kidney failure because of lupus. But if I lived with yoga and Ayurveda 21 years after diagnosis without medications, I'm stressing without medications because with this disease you cannot live without medications. So maybe we can offer the society something from that point of view. Um, I, I, I did not face a lot of objections because of religion for yoga in Saudi Arabia. I'll be very honest, all of you might be shocked because they don't know Hinduism. A lot of them thought it's a Buddhist practice. So when they come to my center that I opened first and uh, I tried my best with whatever license was available, they say, is it Buddhist? So you explain to them. Majority of people came prepared because I was already in Saudi media since 2005 and I explained the religious part. I explained the history and the background. So they are just um, interested and they want more, more health benefits. And So we invited people. The first yoga day celebration, we did it in, um, in Saudi Arabia. We organized it. We, we, we did everything with our group from our yoga foundation. We had three days medical seminars. So we had physiotherapists who are already yoga teachers, um, neurologists who are yoga teachers, ob doctors who are yoga teachers, and we put case studies, researches on variety of health issues like uh, diabetes, women health, um, neurological disease, Parkinson, all the disease that is spreading in Saudi Arabia. And we were surprised with the amount of people who came because we get permission from the Saudi authorities, the external affairs, because the, um, the consulate applied for it. They said this is an, um, a, a celebration we have to do. And they requested for the permission and it was the first public um, legal yoga uh, celebrations in Saudi Arabia. So we took three days, but we had uh, a limited number that we can invite, but we were surprised because we we were allowed for this number, but double the number showed up. And every year it kept increasing, and every year now um, with all these promotions and a lot of people hearing about yoga, a lot of doctors prescribing do, uh, yoga in Saudi Arabia, a lot of surgeons come to us to learn yoga or become um, take the course to be a yoga teacher, but just to understand and do their own researches in yoga. Um, and this is how, how we approached basically. And so that's how the interaction with the government started. And I think so, because it was all over the news. I was surprised that the CNN covered yoga in Saudi Arabia. Wow. So I was like, <laughs> and so you, you met Modiji at yes, some point? Yes, twice. I met him twice. And he, I saw your tweet last night and it seems you said he still remembered you. Yeah, so, so I met him first in the Padma Shri Award ceremony. And he just said, you're a great yoga teacher to work and popularize yoga as a sport in Saudi Arabia. And I met him again. I was invited uh, for the Independence Day in the Rashtrapati Pavan last year. Mm -hmm. So I came late and I was directly behind him. So when he saw me, he said, no, from Saudi Arabia. So uh -huh. I said, yeah, I, it was he like he remembered me immediately. Very nice. So just coming back to yoga. So mm -hmm. there is a clear uh, religious background to yoga. and. So just from an Islamic standpoint, and you may or may not answer it, if you, mm. it depends on if you're not comfortable. I, isn't this blasphemous? I mean, that's what this is. This, this is the narrative in India, right? There are mm. fatwas from um, religious Islamic centers that mm. and there is, you know, uh, all sorts of objections coming on on TV okay. by Malvis and all that. Yoga is Hindu okay. and including Christians right here in India. So, so we heard this in Saudi Arabia from India. Mm. We didn't hear it from Muslims in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. And I have done a Sharia research with a person who is working with us in Arab Yoga Foundation. He's a judge and he's a Sharia specialist. 
And he was a president of a court in Saudi Arabia. He was also handling the health uh, committee in the Saudi Sharia board. And I asked him to get me all the fatwas were issued by our muftis. I'm not talking about other muftis because in Saudi Arabia, we don't have um, sheikhs or imams or mullahs who sit and issue their own fatwas. We don't have. We have just a Muslim scholar board that issue fatwas under the Saudi government banner. So we did not find any fatwa that says yoga is haram. Our Saudi sheikh said there are too, too many types of yoga. This is what we get from the Islamic books. Uh, there are too many types of yoga. If you're practicing the physical and meditation yoga for your health and benefits, that does not go against Islam. But if you're practicing other rituals from other religions, that might go against Islam. Majority, 90% of them, they gave jawaz for it. Jawaz means it's allowed to practice for Muslims. I also had a person who, who works in the Saudi Navy, and he came to learn yoga with us in 2008. But he was also worried. Um, he comes from the south of the kingdom. So he had to call one of the mufti's offices and get the fatwa. So he came to me with the fatwa and he said, no, I'm glad he said I can practice yoga. So what we heard recently is very recent. And we heard it from outside Saudi Arabia. And when I looked carefully, because when I was I started working with the Saudi authorities and regulating yoga. I had to collect all these data. And uh, the only fatwa I found from the Arabic word where basically the first fatwa was from a mufti. His name is Al-Qaradawi. And Al-Qaradawi is a Muslim brotherhood. His fatwas are banned in Saudi Arabia. We don't follow his fatwas. So um, this is um, what we have. People are very comfortable. I want to add one thing that we Saudis, especially my generation, study Islam in schools. We study tafsir, means the explanation of Quran. We study Quran. We study Tawheed, means God is one. Day. We study Fiqh, which is day-to-day -day, uh, life, Sharia. And we are not worried when a Muslim youth lady or a man wants to practice yoga or anything, they're already equipped to know if it clashes or does not clash. And I think if any of us, because I respect both, I will never go and force anybody to chant mantras or try to cheat them and not tell them because sometimes they go to somebody and they don't tell them this is a mantra. I tell people openly everything and people have the choice because I think we should respect people's belief. And yoga, first principle, is ahimsa. Breaking the rules of where you live or not telling people the truth, that is also against ahimsa. So I was very transparent with everything. Even when I spoke um, about yoga to the authorities, when I approached Princess Reema bint Bandar al Saud, who was the deputy, um, kind of a deputy minister, but not really a deputy minister. She was the deputy for the sports authority. And I explained, she said, I know about yoga. And uh, we spoke about it. And I said, do you think we can list it? Because to list it as a therapy, I think with our Ministry of Health, um, there is a lot of um, objections still about yoga as a therapy, where to control and what to control. But uh, listing it as a sport where we can allow centers to get certified, where we can monitor the, the teachers of yoga being trained and certified uh, with the respect of everything else in every land. I'm not just talking about Saudi Arabia. It was, it was very easy. And there wasn't much in yoga to object, actually, by the Saudi society. Mm -hmm. and but what about the mantras are, you know, sometimes sort of very secular in nature, if you like. Uh, they could be calling on for well-being of everyone, and for example. But there are also mantras in yoga, or as part of the practice. For example, the sun salutation, sun salutation or the Surya Namaskar, which is actually a invocation to Surya Deva, if you so like. So when How do you I deal with that? studied in India, I was introduced to so many types and styles of Surya Namaskar, not only the traditional one. And 
even the traditional Surya Namaskar or the Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga Surya Namaskar A and B, it does not have any of that. So I think yoga has a lot to provide for different people from different backgrounds. And what I was trying also to do in Saudi Arabia is to bridge a gap of understanding of the Indian culture and the Saudi culture. We have a lot of similarities and what I explain always to my students that when an Indian teacher or a guru starts his practice, he starts with the mantras. Similarly, Muslims in Saudi Arabia, anything they want to start, even eating food or going to, to shower, they have a prayer to do. So I think respecting people's belief comes also under this banner. Like you as a Hindu prefer to chant your mantra. I might have my Muslim mantra to chant or my Muslim surat. And some of them are, are very universal. So when sometimes you go to a school where the teacher cannot communicate with you properly, they will do their mantras, you do it with them. And you just you think this is an essential part. I might not have a choice to change it. And I don't see a lot of Muslims bother about this part because Muslims uh, or yoga teachers, they know they have a choice that I can take what benefits me and whatever conflicts with my religion, I can take it out. And we have more than 10,000 yoga practitioners in Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about Jeddah, that we run our survey and we have around 10,000 practitioners. But what about Riyadh? We alone in Arab Yoga Foundation, we have 100 teachers in Riyadh. Even if just 10% of them are active and they're teaching 20 people on a daily basis, that's a big number of yoga practitioners. Good. So I did have one question, maybe once again a little uncomfortable. So, you know, our perception of Saudi Arabia, what we read in newspapers that women are not allowed to uh, drive cars. I think that's opened up recently and all of that. You don't wear a hijab or an abaya and you get by it. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, Western media is very unfair with Saudi Arabia. I'll be very honest with you. Life is not that horrible or strict in Saudi Arabia. I've been in Saudi media for 20 years. You can check, you can write my name in Arabic and check how many years back I was in media. I might put a hijab, but I used to walk in the streets sometimes with or sometimes without, but I keep respect. If I go to a government place, if I'm near a mosque, I just put the hijab on my, uh, on my head. I was never harassed for practicing yoga. I'm not just saying this because if that was true, I wouldn't be also leading the yoga activities and regulations in Saudi Arabia. And I know the rules very well because my dad worked for the ministry. My dad was very loyal to the country. No matter what, for him it's life and death. He was very patriotic. I am a patriotic person. I love my country, but also life is not that horrible for women. I had my first business in 2006 in Saudi Arabia. And if women were not really empowered to do something, at least in that field, you wouldn't have seen a lot of successful business women now in Saudi Arabia. Their numbers are, are a lot. Now, there were a lot of restrictions. There was. And a lot of some stories came out in media, but that is not the general life in Saudi Arabia. We still had a window because before King Salman and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, King Abdullah also did empower women a lot. The first woman was ele elected in municipality after 2000. Um, nine or 12, that was in King Abdullah's time. So King Fahad did in his capacity, but there was also a lot of challenges because the problem is also the tradition and the culture. People still want to keep the culture. We come from a very conservative country. Sometimes the government will say women are not to allow are not forced to wear abaya like now. But a lot of women are still keeping their abaya. A lot of women are still keeping their veil or their niqab. It's a, it's for them it's a cultural thing more than um, a forced rule. I never wore niqab in my life. Even my dad, my grandpa is actually an imam and he had his own mosque. But n never, none of me or my sister were forced to wear niqab or cover the face. Only when we go visit families in Mecca, respecting them not to, so we keep a conservative look. Sure. 
And when you come to India and when you're without a hijab, there is no objection no to that? No objection. I'm all, and, I'm, and actually some Saudi media without hijab even before. I was in Arab News 2010 without hijab with my guru, Swami Vidyananda from Sri Urbindo Ashram. And we were sitting in meditation. And um, it was a big picture in Arab News in 2010. And it was... Um, Unbelievable. <laughs> I didn't have any problems with Saudis that time for that picture. <laughs> you would have problems in India, I'm sure, with, with the... Uh, Muslim fatwas and all of that against you. No, no, fatwa can't come against me. <laughs> no, they, I mean, oh, they can't because you're... I'm Saudi. Yeah, okay. <laughs> is, I mean, they can't... The, board, the biggest board of fatwas is the Saudi. Is the Saudi. Oh, okay. So maybe okay. some objection, but not really a fatwa. It won't be valid. Good. So I just wanted it, uh, to open this up to any questions that uh, people may have. So when you started as a uh, yoga teacher in Saudi Arabia and by the time you were the first teacher, were you able to teach men as well because we have heard there was a clear segregation between men and women? Yes, so what I did, I trained men and who were close to me to be able to teach men. Um, now what happened is I was still giving the lectures but the physical practice and I, I actually trained in some men in some companies but I wore um, a white pant and a long kurta and my hijab and it was okay. As far as I'm in a decent dress, it's not a problem. Even that time it wasn't. I have been to Riyadh uh, a number of times so I can definitely substantiate to what or many of the things which she was saying. Uh, and I used to work for Ministry of Taxation, which is yes. just next to Wazarta Saha, the Health Wazarata Ministry. Wazarta Saha, Ministry of Health. <laughs> and um, the truth is uh, that men and women in Saudi Arabia also, they, they work together. So mm. there is no as yeah. such segregation. Yeah, sometimes there are certain segregations, which mm. is there in our country also, like different toilets and sometimes mm. different entrance and so on yeah, and so yeah. forth. Uh, but otherwise, uh, there is no as such, you know, that maybe there is half of a country where only yeah, women yeah. live and another <laughs> half where only men live. That kind of segregation is certainly not there. Yeah. Sure. And then women are part of public life, very hmm. much so. And there are restrictions, which I have also experienced coming from a different country. Anybody hmm. feels the difference. Yeah. Saudi Arab Arabian or any other person come, coming to India would have similar. I wanted to ask you uh, specifically on... Uh, scientific technical side uh, which is uh, that uh, you had you mentioned one problem which is lupus hmm. but you said two hmm. so what was the other can you share if you like to and how it uh, yoga and other things because I had uh, one experience uh, of a friend and his sister facing lupus okay. and she was uh, again held by naturopathy and I have some interest in these things okay. and I have uh, Somewhat, I research many things. Autoimmune, uh, particularly meditation and certain mm. yoga techniques, mm. which work more inside and less on physical, they help tremendously. Mm. So, I wanted you to share that uh, the, because you are saying disease, that. What's your question? The second yeah, disease? What was her other problem? Was um, that also autoimmune? Okay, um, I have lupus and it affected me with other autoimmune things or allergies. I had uh, allergies, severe. Yeah, all autoimmune. It's like, it can be life-threatening for me. So when I was a kid, either they take me to the hospital or I might lose consciousness and then they save me. Depends upon the allergic reaction, the violence of it. Yes, it's... Uh, and then I was diagnosed with cancer in 2014, December. Breast cancer. And I was told in Saudi Arabia that I must do mastectomy and go for chemo. But in India, they told me we will just lim remove the, the tumor. Yeah, pardon radio. And we'll see. But after that, the doctor told me, see, no, if you have an option. Because it was an early stage. So I remained six months months I stayed on a complete naturopathic diet I even removed sugar from my diet and the doctor was surprised that the growth of the cancer was very slow so he told me I think with whatever you're doing you can help yourself I would not advise you to go for the hormonal therapy I'll give you the prescription if you feel you can maybe take it but I would love to observe you for one two years and it's my fifth year and I'm cancer free 
um, for autoimmune and lupus and yoga and naturopathy. So what happens in autoimmune that the immunity of the body loses its, its guidance. So there is no guidance for the immune system. These antibodies go crazy and it attacks uh, different. Go crazy is there. Because it can go in both positive and negative directions. Yes, direction. it can be. Now I heard that it can even attack the ears or the eyes. So it can go anywhere. So lupus is like that. It mm. can attack any part of the body. Any part of the body. And then it can be as violent as killing that body. And actually, cancer is less scary than lupus yes, because yes. with cancer they can treat it in early but stage. But lupus, it's growing. It's, I yeah. Mean, I know a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to share uh, some papers if uh, they are uh, there in Saudi Arabia and some research has happened in yoga okay. and. Uh, I wish lots of them with uh, uh, Lara Salazar, if I'm not wrong, in some U.S. universities. No, no, I, I was specifically asking about research done in, oh, Saudi, research Arabia. Done in Saudi Arabia. We are still working. Because so there are a lot of papers which are only in Arabic, so access yeah. becomes poorer. Sure. Okay, we can okay. talk nice. about it. You see, yoga has eight components that traditionally speaking. Ashtanga. Ashtanga yoga. So, uh, do, do you think, you know, certain parts like the physical part, self-control and so on, they are more compatible, whereas when you go into the other things like dhyana, dharana, mm -hmm. samadhi, there you start getting these uh, philosophical conflicts. What is your opinion on that? Um, my opinion that yoga cannot be practiced physically only and you need the understanding of the philosophy. That's why we teach theory and practice. And I think the philosophical aspect of yoga gives you the guidelines of your roadmap with yoga. Where are you going and what is happening with you? There will be a lot of questions. Sometimes you don't find answers. And there is something in philosophy. There is also something in science. And the beauty of yoga that you can say 90% of the yoga philosophy was proven scientifically. So I think it's very important. Did I answer you? I think his question was more about does it spiritual yeah right? does it become come in conflict with islam no because in a graded manner. that is as if you do asanas it probably does not at all on the other hand if you talk about samadhi then probably there will be philosophical problems that is what I um mean. okay because let me tell you something to get into areas of union no, no. Yeah. i'm a clinical no, psychologist no, 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 concept of gab and all which is almost identical so, so you have to study. i was interested to understand everything related in yoga even if i couldn't but i'll tell you one thing asan's practice with pranayams affects certain parts of the brain that is responsible about spirituality yes. the sense of time the sense of place will reduce and the brain waves will change prepares you for dying so we can't separate yoga and spirituality no matter what we say no matter what we say oh no i'm just practicing asanas i'm not going on the spiritual part if you practice asana and pranayams and the control of breath and asana properly you are immediately prepared to go on meditation. Some students just get up of Savasana and they just stay. They don't feel like interacting with anybody or moving around and then they start getting interested in meditation. And meditation is not banned in Islam. There is something. There is the radicals who say everything related to relaxation and Savasana and meditation is banned. And there are people who are moderate Muslims who practice meditation themselves because it's part of the religion in every religion. In fact, I have read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true, but uh, Prophet Muhammad, when he spent 10 days or something, uh, something like that in a cave, uh, there is a Bangladesh and he was mm. actually meditating, is one mm. sort of... Uh, they all the prophets night. meditated, yeah. and Samadhi isn't so Sufism, by the way, they call it as Samadhi. Sorry? Samadhi is a level also in Sufism. It's called as Samadhi. Okay. Hmm. Think about that. Hmm. So, do you teach Patanjali's uh, Ashra Yoga and do you teach the soul cleaning and soul healing techniques? Yes, we teach that. Teach and that? we regularly bring people to India. 
Uh, every year we bring two or three groups. Um, there are around 30 people or less and we teach them. And uh, we have with us also Mr. Debral. Uh, he's the disciple of Swami Veda Bharati. He teaches them philosophy, Vedas and a lot of things. And they're totally open to learn and also try. If there aren't any more questions, we'll close the session. Thank you for being a wonderful champion of yoga. Thank you. Thank you.